Alrighty, so in this video I'm going to take a look at circular motion, or specifically uniform circular motion. So to get started, let's have a look at some uh, key things you just need to know before we can dig further into this topic. So we're going to introduce this new um, property, it's called angular velocity. And so if you think about an object that will be moving in a circle, what we can do is talk about angular velocity, which is the number of radians, or the angle, that an object rotates through every second. So it's the SI unit of it is radians per second. Um, it's possible you're given it in degrees per second and need to convert, but the SI unit's radians per second. You also come across this word, centripetal. Uh, and all it means is acting towards the centre. So you might come across centripetal acceleration, which means it's accelerating towards the centre, or centripetal force, which means the force is acting towards the centre. It's just a fancy word for that. And some properties you've come across before when you were looking at waves in year 12, um, but just to reiterate them, time period in the context of circular motion is the time taken for the object to complete one full circle, and it's measured in seconds, and the frequency is the number of circles it travels per second, measured in hertz, or which is the same as a one over second in base units. There. So those are the key things you need to know. You'll also need to know how to convert between angular and what's called linear velocity, which is what you're familiar with from year 12, when you looked at things like projectile motion and stuff, which we usually give the symbol V here. So first, let's start off by looking at the units. So angular speed is in radians per second, whereas linear velocity is in meters per second. So essentially what we need to do is work out how to convert between radians and meters. Now we do this by thinking about um, a, like essentially a whole circle. So if we just sketch one out there. Now we know one full revolution in a circle in terms of radians is 2 pi radians. So to go all the way around once in radians is 2 pi. And in terms of distance, uh, we know one full revolution in meters will be 2 pi r, so 2 pi times the radius of this circle. Yeah, so let's sketch that in very roughly. Uh, it's a pretty poor diagram actually, but never mind. Um, so essentially we can see here that to go from revolutions in your angular, angular type to revolutions in linear, we need to multiply by r, my multiply by the radius. So that's how we end up with this equation here. The linear speed, or linear velocity v, is the angular speed times the radius. And this is essentially a way of thinking about how that conversion works. Okay, so let's link that into time period and the frequency. So if we know that one full circle is 2 pi radians, and it's traveling at omega radians per second, that's usually the symbol we use for angular velocity, we essentially are trying to end up with just seconds. So by looking at the units here, if we want to end up with seconds overall, we need to have uh, radians on the top line and uh, radians per second on the bottom line, because that way these radians will cancel out, and because the bottom line is being divided, that will promote the seconds to the top line. So that you can look at it in terms of the dimensions or the units here, which is quite helpful. And so what we end up here is we can work out the time period in terms of the angular speed here. So it's just 2 pi divided by angular speed. And that's another key equation you'll need to be using. Now to link in frequency, you will know from waves that the time period and frequency are just the inverse of each other. Um, so we've got the frequency is just 1 over the time period here. And so we can substitute in for the time period now, because we know the time period is this. We end up with this expression here. And just juggling it around, we'll get it into this form, which is what you'll usually see it quoted in. So we get the angular speed is 2 pi times the frequency there. And frequency is something you'll see a lot more of when we get onto simple harmonic motion later on. Um, because the time period is very easy to measure, which we can then link into frequency. But um, these are the key equations we should know so far. And just to um, 
define what we mean by uniform circular motion. So all of the motion you'll see in these topics in A-level will be uniform circular motion. And what that means is that the object is travelling at constant linear speed. Uh, it's not constant velocity because the direction is constantly changing as going around the circle, but it is constant speed and therefore it has constant angular speed as well. So omega is going to be constant in these examples. And also to be in uniform circular motion, it's going to be acted on a force of a constant magnitude. So the magnitude of the force stays the same, but and that force is always directed towards the center. So it doesn't matter where in the circle it is, the force is always directed towards the center. Okay, so that's what we've got so far. So to finish off um, this video, we are going to look at how we can get to an expression for the centripetal acceleration for an object to be in circular motion and then link that so we can calculate the force required for centripetal uh, acceleration and required for circular motion, which will then apply to things like satellites and electrons orbiting around nuclei and those kinds of things. So it's a very useful expression, but it's important you know where it comes from. Okay, so we're going to do, do some polar coordinates to uh, work through this and derive the expressions that we're looking for. So we've got this circle that, of the motion that we're dealing with, and it's got its radius is r. So at this particular point here, when the object is here, its displacement, if we make the center of the circle 0, 0, in the x direction, which is going to be this way as in con convention, the displacement here, so the displacement in the x direction is going to be r cosine theta, so we're just essentially resolving it into components just like you'll have done in year 12, and the y displacement is going to be r sine theta. Okay. Um, but that's not a particularly useful form, actually. We're going to be taking the derivative of this with respect to t, so we need to make um, this a function of t. And the way we're going to do that is by using this equation here, so I'll just write it down at the top. So the angle is going to be the angular speed times time, and we get that because we know that angular speed is essentially the angle per second, so essentially we're just modifying that equation. And it's this form of it that's going to be particularly useful, because we can substitute that straight in, so it's r cosine omega t, and here you've got r sine omega t, like this. So we've got two expressions for the displacement of the object at this point in the circle. So what we want to do is end up with an expression for the velocity at this position. And we can do that because we know that the velocity is the derivative of the displacement because it's the rate of change of displacement. So let's take the derivative of these two expressions over here with respect to t. So you're going to need to be using your A-level maths uh, to be doing this. So you might, if you don't know what we're doing, you might want to go back and revise. Otherwise, you know, a gaping hole in your knowledge. Um, so we're going to end up with uh, cos goes to minus sine, and we've got omega multiplying the t in the bracket, so that's going to come outside. So we're going to end up with o minus omega r sine omega t there. And then in terms of the y direction, we're just going to have sine just goes to cosine and the omega is going to come outside. Omega r cosine omega t. Okay, so we've got an expression for the velocity, but I said we we're working towards centripetal acceleration. Uh, so let's take the derivative one more time to get expressions for the acceleration. Acceleration in the x direction is going to be uh, minus omega squared, now r cosine omega t. And then the acceleration in the y direction is going to now minus there as well. And that's going to be 
sine omega t now. Now we had before that this r cos omega t is just going to be sx, so it's just going to be minus omega squared sx, and it's just going to be minus omega squared sy, like this. So we've got expressions for the x and y components of acceleration, so to get what actual acceleration is in all directions, that's just going to be the like vector addition of those two, so by adding the squares and square rooting, so you end up with this expression here, the square root of both expressions are going to end up with this omega to the power of 4, because both of them are going to have minus omega squared, squared. And you end up with sx squared plus sy squared. Now, square root of omega to the 4 is going to be omega squared. And sx squared plus sy squared is just going to be r. If we look back up at the diagram here, if we square sx squared and y squared and add them together, we should just get r squared. Um, and then when we square root that, we will just get r. Uh, so we can get, put that in there. So what we get is the centripetal acceleration of the object is calculate in order to be in circular motion, is calculated by um, omega squared r. And we get this expression here. And if we... We know that uh, V is R omega, which means that omega is V over R. So we get, end up with acceleration is V squared over R squared, because that's omega squared times R, which means that your centripetal acceleration is V squared over R, which is the other form you see this equation in. So these are the two main forms you see for centripetal acceleration. So if we want centripetal force, we know using Newton's second law, force is mass times acceleration, so we therefore know that force is going to be either mv squared over r, just multiplying by that, or it's just going to be m omega squared r. And that gives you an expression for the centripetal force required for an object to be in circular motion. So this is a condition that needs to be met for an object to be in circular motion. And that's the completed derivation of the various expressions you're going to need during the circular motion topic.